Hi, it's Rory Darkins here, and I'm really looking forward to presenting the upcoming live stream, Positive Sports Psychology, Cultivating Deep Wellbeing. In this live stream, we'll be covering what wellbeing is and how we measure it. We'll be looking at the links between wellbeing and sustainable high performance. We'll identify practical, science-based strategies to optimize wellbeing, and we'll have a Q&A in order to answer your questions to help you build deep well-being for yourself and others in your life. It's on Saturday the 10th of September and tickets are available now. Would love to see you there. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome to episode 339 of The Physical Performance Show, proudly brought to you by Polar's stunning new generation running watches, the Polar Pacer and the Polar Pacer Pro, and our upcoming live stream event featuring mental skills coach and positive sports psychology researcher, Rory Darkins, cultivating deep well-being, scheduled for the 10th of September. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. Of course, we do this across a range of our different episodes, featured performers, interest editions, coaches' corners, learning catch episodes, and of course, our expert editions. And off the back of last week's Rewired episode featuring Associate Professor Rich Willey, which explored the biomechanics, physiology and unique needs of the Masters runner, we're keeping the running theme going this week as we rewire Dr. Rich Blagrove, strength and conditioning coach, exercise physiologist, researcher and author of Strength and Conditioning for Endurance Running. In 2017, Richard and his research team published a landmark systematic review which explored the effects of strength training on the physiological determinants of middle and long distance running performance. Richard's research interests lie very much in the use of strength-based exercise as a tool to improve the metabolic cost of running. More recently, Richard has begun to investigate the consequences of low energy availability on physical performance and health biomarkers in endurance athletes. But get set today to learn or revise a whole lot around the how, what and scientific whys behind why runners and endurance athletes need and will benefit from strength training. Get your pen and paper ready. Here is my conversation, Rewired, with Dr. Dr. Richard Blagrove. Rich Blagrove, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. This exploration of strength and conditioning for endurance running is a topic I have been excited to explore with you for a long time. So great to uh, finally connect to record this uh, episode. No, thanks very much for the invitation, Brad. I'm uh, really excited to discuss a few things with you. Rich, your academic professional bio as per the top of the show is extensive but can you put put us in perspective with a typical day slash week in the life of Richard Blagrove? Yeah absolutely um, my job's really varied and I think that's one of the reasons that I enjoy doing it so at the moment I'm senior lecturer and course lead for an undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science at Birmingham City University uh, which is, is in central uh, England in the United Kingdom. Um, and typically my week's made up of roughly about 12 or so hours of teaching on exercise physiology and, and strength and conditioning modules. Um, and around that I get to interact with the students one-on-one -on -one in tutorials, uh, which is which is often really enjoyable. Um, I still do quite a bit of consultancy work with individual athletes and primarily distance runners. So I'll typically see uh, one or two distance runners a week, and again, that's that's one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, and I guess as you'd expect for most academics, like there's a lot of admi- ad- administration work, so a lot of emails, meetings, um, and jobs jobs that go go with part and parcel of being an academic. And try and find as much time as possible to do some research, which uh, at the moment isn't very much. But if I can spend time writing a paper or collecting some data in the laboratory um, on some projects that I'm working on, um, that's always nice as well. And Rich, your academic uh, background there with regards to literature, it's all very high quality. And uh, I spent some time in the lead up to this just perusing the many uh, papers of which you've uh, produced and co-authored. And certainly, if anyone was to, uh, from an academic sense, search any of the of the, uh, the key search engines for uh, strength and conditioning training for runners, uh, your name will pop up more often than not. Uh, Rich, in addition to all that scientific literature and work, academic work, you also penned uh, an absolutely terrific resource for runners, coaches, um, and practitioners alike, and that's strength and conditioning for endurance running in 2015. And I think uh, as a great preface to the, what we're going to discuss today, I'll read a little snippet from the preface, page seven. And you, and you write like so, despite the apparent uncertainty amongst many runners concerning the benefits of strength and conditioning, there does appear to be a growing awareness of its value. Coaches and runners are becoming increasingly keen on learning about the latest new training techniques or ways to stay injury free. No longer is the running community viewing strength and conditioning as only something elite runners include to give them an edge over their rivals. Yet despite the rising interest in strength and conditioning for runners, there is unfortunately a lack of high quality literature available. And I think that really sums up our conversation today in terms of where we want to go. So Rich, can you you start just by, you know, outlining, maybe it's just my professional bias as a full-time clinician, but in, in recent years, there does seem to be a greater awareness from recreational runners, not just the elite, uh, the pointy end of, uh, of the races uh, or abilities, as to the benefits of strength and conditioning. Would you agree with that? And what do you think is driving that trend? Yeah, I do agree. And I think it really depends on which individual runners or groups that you're speaking to. Um, and as we were saying offline just before this, um, I think as both academics and uh, when I'm in my strength and conditioning coaching role, we we, we live in little bubbles in a way. Um, I think spending time in the laboratory, publishing research and working with elite level athletes is sometimes not quite in the real world. Um, and so I really enjoy doing things like this and going to speak with groups of coaches, athletics clubs and delivering at conferences because you get like a real flavour of kind of what's going on um, in the masses and what's what's going on with the public and the distance running community. But there does seem to have been a trend over the last five years at least that people are becoming more aware of the benefits of doing strength and conditioning and, and lifting weights and so on. Um, so I think that's partly been driven by improved education through the national governing bodies and just better awareness through the media. So resources uh, like, like this podcast, for example, and then I've wrote, written quite a lot in newspapers and magazines and so on. So through various different types of media, I, th- I think the messages are getting out about uh, some of the benefits that can be gained. Yeah, and it's terrific to see because, as you mentioned there, the word benefits, you know, they're manifold and they're, uh, you know, they're real. Uh, Rich, in terms of, you know, the trend in greater awareness, let's maybe before we talk about the benefits, just get clear on what strength and conditioning even is. And certainly in, in your book, you reference these in detail. So maybe to start with, what is strength training? I think most people associate strength training and even strength and conditioning more generally with just going to a gym and just just lifting heavy weights, um, which, which it isn't really. I mean, that's lifting weights is, is part of it, but strength and conditioning is more about kind of global physical preparation for sports performers. Um, and so if you're an athlete that's at a recreational level, you're a young athlete who's got aspirations to reach a high performance status, or if you're an elite athlete, it's essentially any types, any type of physical training which um, isn't your actual sport itself. So, obviously, the technical coach will take care of 
any of the the kind of motor skills, technical requirements and the physical training that is the sport. And then aside from that, the strength and conditioning coach would essentially be responsible for, for anything else. So, yeah, that's going to be resistance training. It might be stretching. It might be some specific uh, late stage rehabilitation or prehab type work. And it can even extend into areas like recovery strategies, uh, monitoring of athlete readiness and and recovery from training sessions, and even touching upon things like supplementation for athletes and so on. So it is a really broad area, which is certainly more than just lifting weights in a gym. And by, you know, further definition, you know, you write that strength is defined loosely as the highest amount of force that a muscle group can produce under special conditions. So I guess the key word there is force and special conditions as a term. Yeah, absolutely. And like, it depends which textbook you look in. And there's a, there's obviously a lot of different definitions. I think the best one that I've seen has probably come from two of my ex-colleagues actually at St. Mary's University. And that was in a textbook that was published quite recently. Um, and they define s- strength as the expression of force under a specific set of movement constraints, which is pretty much the same as the definition that you've just said. But um, uh, yeah, st- strength is essentially about the amount of force that we're producing. Um, and it's always going to be specific to a certain set of demands and constraints associated with a, a skill that we're trying to perform. Can you clarify the different types of strength before we talk about the benefits of strength training slash strength and conditioning? Uh, you know, you write that there's m- multiple uh, different expressions of strength, maximum or absolute strength firstly. What, what are you referring to there? So, yeah, maximum strength is essentially the, the highest amount of force that a muscle or a muscle group can generate under some sort of specific set of movement constraints. Um, and so we t- typically measure that because we want to try and assess it with the whole of the human body during some sort of bilateral type movement um, and through some sort of triple extension pattern through the lower limb. So what I mean by that is extension through the ankle, knee and hips simultaneously. Um, And because that's got similarities with the sorts of skills we see in sport and certainly um, the running gait pattern, it's a relatively good measure of maximal strength. Um, I mean, I I guess it's worth adding at this point that I'd – the, the way that I would assess maximal strength would typically be isometrically, um, and you often need quite fancy kit in a biomechanics lab to try and assess that. So, I'd again the, the the textbook definition of the way that we'd assess maximal strength would be with a one repetition max test on something like a back squat or a deadlift um, or a resistance machine, and um, because it's quite a general type quality. I wouldn't I wouldn't be worried too much about trying to assess it if you haven't got access to the sort of equipment that I, I use in a biomechanics lab. And then what about relative strength? Yeah, so relative strength is really important for any sports which are weight-bearing in nature. So you've got to carry your body weight around, like distance running, for example. So relative strength is essentially how much force you're producing per kilogram of body weight. Um, and so if we can keep body mass the same, and obviously with an endurance athlete, we don't really want to see any sort of change in muscle mass or no, no significant change in muscle mass. Um, but we can increase the amount of force we're developing. We get a, we get an increase in, in relative strength. So how much force we're producing per kilogram of body weight. Explosive strength. What do you uh, mean by explosive strength? Yeah, so explosive strength is essentially the amount of force we're we're developing under um, time constraints. And so, again, thinking about sport generally, like there's a requirement to produce quite high levels of force through most sports skills. Um, but usually, the amount of time that we've got to express that force is relatively short. So we take um, the running gait action, and typically for long distance runners, their foot's on the ground for about a quarter of a second, so about 0.25 of a second. So they've obviously got to express like relatively high levels of force, even though it's uh, it's distance running in quite short periods of time. And if we're looking at middle distance runners, it's a little bit quicker still. So 
usually under 0.2 of a second. So explosive strength refers to how rapidly we're developing force within a specific short time constraint. And so it differs from maximum and relative strength. And then, you know, you reference that perhaps the most important form of strength for endurance running is reactive or plyometric strength. And of all the four strength qualities, uh, including this one, you, you know, you say that reactive strength is undoubtedly the most important to the endurance runner. So what is reactive strength and why is it so important? Yeah, so it's a, as, as I was just referring to, so during a distance running action, um, typically you've got to be expressing force really quickly in less than a quarter of a second. But because the foot's landing down on the ground with quite a high amount of force, the energy that's, um, that, we, that we get from that landing can be stored in uh, elastic tissue, so primarily the Achilles tendon. Um, and so the amount of energy that stores and then subsequently releases in that short time frame is a really trainable quality. And so would loosely refer to that as reactive strength. So if your foot's on and off the ground very, very quickly, the more energy return that we can get from elastic tissues, the better, because essentially it allows us to save energy for later on during a training session or um, or a race. And so training reactive strength with prime, uh, plyometric training primarily um, is a really useful way of, of developing force in, in runners. Thanks for, uh, for outlining those different types of strength there, Rich, and we'll loop back and explore those uh, shortly. But next... Uh, Benefits of strength training. Uh, I think it's increasingly known that there are benefits, uh, performance oriented benefits, injury reduction benefits that the scientific literature definitely validates, including some of your reviews. Can you wrap uh, some thoughts around uh, why strength training is so beneficial to running, in particular endurance running? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of performance, first of all, um, the majority of the scientific literature, so we're talking between 20 and 25 studies, has shown that we see improvements in running economy of between about 2 and 8% after two to three months of engaging with um, a strength training program. So for, you, for your listeners, r- running economy is defined as the energy cost or the amount of energy that we're using at some sort of submaximal running intensity up to about 10 kilometers to pace. So essentially, if we get a reduction in running economy, we're using less energy and also less oxygen for the same intensity of effort or the same the same running speed. Um, and so there's a little bit of controversy within the scientific community, especially well, uh, who say that running economy is obviously this sort of physiological construct that we measure in laboratories. And does it actually have very much real world relevance? But in quite a few of those studies, they also measure time trial performance over distance of 1500 meters all the way up to um, 10,000 meters and again typically those studies are showing that we see improvements in time trial performance in a group that have done two or three strength training sessions a week for a few months compared to a group that just carried on their normal running so it does seem that um, the benefits that we get for with running economy also translate into performance improvements. And there, there has been a couple of publications that are showing that there is there does seem to be a direct link to something that's that's a bit more usable for runners. Um, the other big area that it just seems to improve is more anaerobic type qualities. So what I mean by anaerobic is any sorts of performance which doesn't use oxygen, so high intensity type efforts. So things like maximal sprint speed typically seems to change after a period of strength training. So that has obvious advantages if you're a high performing distance runner and uh, where you see typically races being won in sprint finishes. Um, But for any type of distance runner, right down to recreation, if we can raise your top speed sprinting and we compare that to a submaximal running speed, which there's obviously quite a big difference, if we need, if we can increase that difference, we improve something called the anaerobic speed reserve. So essentially running at, slower, at lower intensities feels a little bit easier because our top speed, our kind of ceiling of, uh, of, of maximal effort is, has improved a little bit. So those are kind of the three main performance areas that we see improved. And as, as you alluded to in your question, um, it's also 
quite strongly believed in physios, clinicians and strength and conditioning coaches that we see a reduction in injury risk as a result of performing strength training over an extended period of time. So um, typically for me, that's things like improving bone mineral density because we see a relatively high rate of stress fractures um, in distance runners. Improving um, tendon and ligament resilience is, is also really important. Um, and also just improving coordination generally. So I think if you're performing resistance training um, very well, we're not just getting benefits to the lower limb musculature, but we're getting improvements in posture and we're getting improvements in coordination on just quite basic functional movements. So there are bits and pieces of evidence floating around that we see subtle changes in some kinematic variables during the running action, um, particularly if we're performing strength training around uh, the hip and I'm referring to like the glute muscles mainly. And Rich, of all those things, if nothing was attractive, uh, I think one thing that every runner would gravitate towards is an improvement in time trial performance. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, uh, absolutely. The injury reductions, yeah, and that's the most important thing to mention. And you can I can talk all day about VO two max and running economy and so on, but the, those types of construct don't have much meaning to uh, to a runner. They're like, is is this going to make me quicker? Is it going to make me uh, get, get me a personal best performance? Is it going to win me a race? Um, and it's difficult to answer that, but the majority of evidence suggests that it will help. So I think that needs to be the main message. Absolutely. And uh, if, if that grabs, uh, you know, and the attention of a runner uh, who perhaps is listening in and not yet strength training, I think uh, this next section will explore, which is uh, common myths around strength and conditioning that yeah, sure. you may be able to dispel. And then we can loop back and sort of wrestle those uh, injury reduction benefits and performance benefits to the ground a little bit with some specifics. So, Rich, common things that I hear in practice as a full-time practitioner, physiotherapist, when I may share that a runner would benefit from uh, some strength training or strength and conditioning one would be, and you write about it in your book, and that is uh, lifting weights will make me put on muscle. I'm a runner. I don't want to be bulky. So <laughs> what do you say to that? No, I, I, fully, I fully agree with you. It's, it's, it's a common um, concern that I hear in the running community. Um, and it's a very reasonable concern as well because I think, as I've already mentioned, if we see a substantial increase in mass over a long period of time, which may or may not be attributed to a resistance training program, that's obviously going to be detrimental uh, to a runner. They've got to carry that mass around with them for the distance that they run. Um, I mean, again, if we just if we look at the scientific literature, so all those studies that I mentioned that have used strength training and resistance exercise over two or three month periods um, to try and look at changes in physiology and changes in structure, like very, very few of them see any sorts of change in body mass. Um, and a study that I actually did as part of my PhD where we took a group of 25 young distance runners who were aged between 15 and 18. Um, we separated them out into two groups, one that did uh, strength training twice a week for 10 weeks and another group that just carried on their normal running. Um, and in both groups, uh, we didn't see any change in body mass um, as a result of those uh, of those two different types of intervention. And so I think on the face of it, like runners don't shouldn't be too worried that they're going to put on any mass because there isn't much evidence that it actually happens. Um, and it's probably because the sorts of volumes that they, the vol volumes of resistance training that those studies are using and that I used as part of my PhD study are actually relatively low, just in the context of just resistance training generally. Um, and so when you look at the amount the amount of volume that like a bodybuilder would do, um, or even somebody in the general population that starts doing resistance training um, in a gym, like they're much higher than typically I would prescribe for a runner and these types of studies are using. So I think the first thing to say is you don't need to do very much volume to get stronger and achieve some of the benefits that I've already outlined. Um, and the second thing is we, we tend to see something which is termed an interference effect when we combine aerobic types of training and strength training as part of the same training program. So although, although it seems to be beneficial to aerobic type um, qualities, 
if we do resistance training. We tend to see a little bit of blunting of strength type adaptations. And one type of strength adaptation that we get from resistance training is an increase in muscle mass, which is known as hypertrophy. So if we're seeing a little bit of blunting in a hypertrophy response as uh, when we combine aerobic and strength training in the same program, that's actually kind of a good thing for the distance runner because we don't want to put on any sort of muscle mass. So if we're seeing gains in strength, which are probably coming from nervous system type adaptations, but we're not really seeing a change in muscle mass, um, then that's obviously going to be most beneficial. Um, I think the concern for me probably comes a bit more longer term. So inevitably, if a distance runner is engaging with resistance training over an extended period of time, so we're talking years, at some point, volume is going to have to start to increase. There's only kind of so much variation we can get with exercise choice and sets and reps and so on. So at some point when we start ramping volume up a little bit, um, there's always going to be a little bit of a danger that we're going to put on muscle mass. Like typically I've not I've not really seen it in practice when I've, I've with the runners that I've been working with for years and years. Um, but I think it is a little bit of a concern. And again, if we look at middle distance runners, particularly the sort of 400, 800 types, um, Naturally, they've probably got a higher percentage of fast twitch muscle fibers, which um, have got a higher affinity for gains in mass, so a hypertrophy response following resistance training. I, I tend to be a little bit careful with that type of population, um, just because, as I say, the, the, they're probably a little bit more likely to put on mass if we start ramping up the volume of resistance training. Um, but in summary, I, I don't think there's really much to worry about. The evidence doesn't point to um, gains in mass. And again, through my coaching practice, I've, I've, I've not really come across it very much. Thank you. One of the other common uh, pushbacks I encounter, Rich, in my professional work is that uh, a runner wants to run and they don't want their weekly cycle uh, interrupted by uh, DOMS or sore muscles, if you like, yeah. following strength training. So what can you say to that? It's, it's a concern I get quite a lot, and I'm in constant touch with the athletes that I'm working with um, almost every single day to sort of find out how they're feeling and responding to the strength training that uh, that I've, I've set them. Um, I mean, my general rule with this is if the DOMS is so bad on the fatigue that they're getting as a result of the, the, the training that I've given them, that is impacting their running session. So for example, if, if I give them a strength training session on a Monday morning and then Tuesday evening, they've got a hard interval training session. If they're so fatigued as a result of my session that it's adversely affecting their interval training session, then I've probably got my programming wrong. If they are, if, if they're carrying a little bit of DOMS and they say, Rich, I'm feeling a little bit sore today. I don't know if I should do the session. I'll typically say, go and warm up, see how you feel, because nine times out of 10, they'll warm up and they'll probably have the best session they've had for a long time or it's not affected them in any sort of way. And so I'd, I think a lot of the time, a little bit of soreness that you, you might get from resistance training is probably more mental than it is physical. Um, and usually you're fine. But as I say, if the soreness is so bad, that it is hampering the way that you're running um, and you, you feel too fatigued to perform the session, then whichever coach or trainer that you're working with has probably given you too much, um, too much too soon. And again, quite quickly, uh, because of so something known as the repeat bout effect, like after a sort of week of a new program or a couple of weeks, if, you've, if you're starting resistance training for a first time, I generally see these types of effects starting to subside. So um, the delayed onset of muscle soreness that, that we're referring to doesn't seem to happen after a couple of weeks yet. We're still seeing improvements um, in strength. So, um, yeah, those, those are kind of the general rules that, the, that I would use. One of the myths that you cite is that runners believe they should just run and, and run more and running is going to make them better uh, with the, the greater volume of, of running training. But as you've outlined, the benefits are there and they seem to be very clear that the performance gains alone would sort of uh, quieten that that concern. The other one being that strength training is dangerous. I think uh, anecdotally, most people probably know of someone that's been to a gym and have lifted something perhaps incorrectly or with uh, too much gusto too soon and they've pulled up with a sore back or something's happened in the gym. And so this sort of uh, this sentiment that strength training can be dangerous really 
uh, can be uh, quite pervasive. So what would you say to that as a concern of runners who are contemplating strength training and they're fearful that they'll injure themselves in the gym? Yeah, I think this one is a sort of classic myth. And uh, again, looking at the, the actual evidence that it's a risky activity, um, I think compared to other sports, so yeah, you're in invasion game type sports, you racket sports and um, and other types of physical physical activity, it, it carries a very, very low risk, like very low risk. And I think the fear really comes in that if an injury does happen, it, it's, it's generally quite severe. Um, it's always going to be a, an acute injury, such as, like you say, a back spasm or a muscle tear or somebody dropping a weight on a head or something. So it looks really, really bad. Um, but when you actually look at how often that occurs, it's um, the rate is very, very low. When you compare it to overuse injury and distance runners, for example, which is actually quite high, even compared to uh, to other sports, um, actually the risk is a lot higher by do doing distance running and doing it in high volume. So um, I think a lot of those types of acute injury and those accidents that I was referring to before, nearly all of them come in environments that aren't supervised. Um, so typically if you're going into a gym, and you start lifting quite heavy weights and you've not done it before, you've not got a coach with you, you're not too sure what technique you're supposed to be using, yeah, obviously the risk is going to start to increase. But and I don't, but I don't think that risk is unique to resistance training. I think that if you went into any sort of new sporting environment and you didn't know what you were doing, um, you're probably going to get injured. Like you're not going to go and play ice hockey having uh, not stepped on ice before. <laughs> you're probably going to fall over and, and hurt yourself. Um and so, yeah, the key message really is that if you're going to embark upon these types of activities, which seems to be quite beneficial, then you probably need to find yourself somebody, a coach or a trainer who's um, who's got qualifications in this and kind of knows the way around a gym or a weight training facility and can kind of guide you through some basic techniques that then potentially you can go off and, uh, and do in your own time. So supervision uh, is, is definitely key. And then, Rich, final two myths. One is endurance performers or runners they need muscular endurance and not muscular strength what would you say to that yeah and i think i, I refer to this as kind of the specificity trap um because i th yeah I, th I think quite naturally and logically if you're trying to get an improvement in your sport you want to do movement patterns you want to do repetition ranges and you want to kind of experience the sorts of emotions and sensations that you're uh, you're experiencing competition in your sport um but what's important for me and as i've kind of already alluded to a little bit with the definitions of strength um if we know that an improvement in maximal force producing capability or an improvement in the rate at which you can develop force or reactive strength provides us with an improvement in performance then it's those physical qualities that we need to be training in a non-specific setting, if hopefully that makes sense. Um, so rather than just trying to simulate or mimic what's going on in the sport, we need to try and set runners up with exercises, repetition ranges, which really overload specific physiological adaptations, which allow us to get changes in those physical qualities. So if we take maximal strength as just a basic example, if I want to try and improve the highest amount of force that I can develop, I need to set my runner up in a position that allows them to generate the high levels of force. So typically that's not going to be on one leg. It's not going to be standing on an unstable surface. Um, it's not going to be lifting a light weight. Like I've got to be on two feet. I've got to be stable. I've got to be using my body in a way that allows me to generate high levels of force. And that overloads the nervous system in a way which increases the number of muscle fibers that I can recruit. Um, and similarly, taking reactive strength as an example, um, runners' foot's on and off the ground really quickly in about a quarter of a second, as we've said. And so I need to overload that feature. So I need to keep the ground contact time relatively short, but I need to overload the amount of energy or the amount of force that that athlete's experiencing on landing. So it's teaching the tendons to cope with higher amounts of energy and to store that energy and use it productively. So therefore, plyometric training really needs to overload the kind of height that we're landing from or the distance that we're traveling across the ground. So doing simple exercises like jumping over mini hurdles increases the height that the, the, uh, the runner's having to 
uh, land from and doing hopping and bounding is increasing the distance or the stride length that a runner's moving through. So you're essentially teaching the body to kind of cope with higher levels of force and higher levels of energy, which then turn into physiological adaptations. And then we get improvements in those qualities that uh, that underpin running economy primarily. And, you know, you, you cite it very simply, and I, I like this, you say, uh, use the right tools for the right job. If you want to improve your muscular endurance, go for a run. If you want yeah, to improve yes, your precisely. strength qualities, then lift some weights. So so thank you for outlining that. And, and, and the final myth that uh, I believe the tide might be starting to turn uh, just from observation, and that is that young runners shouldn't lift weights. So can you speak to uh, young runners in a strength and conditioning sense and yeah. what we need to be aware of? Absolutely. And this this seems to have been a really topical area, certainly within strength and conditioning for the last 10 to 15 years now. And as you say, the tide seems to be slowly turning, but um, there's still a lot of myths out there about adolescents and children engaging with resistance training. Um, essentially, the the basic message is that it is safe and effective for youngsters to lift weights at virtually any age. I mean, when they're emotionally mature enough to sort of walk into a weight training facility and follow the instructions of a qualified coach, they're kind of ready to engage with this type of activity. And again, this doesn't mean getting them under a bar, putting 20 kilograms on each side and saying, right, we're going to lift as much weight as you can today. It means at a young age, introducing them to some basic body weight exercises um, which are really based around just basic fundamental human movements so teaching them how to squat effectively teaching them how to hip hinge how to pull and push how to rotate effectively brace through the midsection um, how to handle their own body weight on one leg through stepping and lunging type patterns um, and then actually keeping it quite varied um, and not structuring it too much. So not necessarily setting sessions around set reps and loads, but just keeping it relatively fun. Um, and so they're enjoying it and, engage, and engaging with it. And then as they start getting a little bit older and they're moving through early, early adolescence and puberty, then you can start to um, incorporate some basic resistance. So use of medicine balls, use of elastic bands, use of light dumbbells and potentially a barbell um, is a safe and effective way to start loading a young athlete. And hopefully at that point, the, the technique's relatively uh, relatively solid. And so the idea being, ideally, by the time they get to late adolescence and then they're starting to specialise in a certain sport and hopefully something like distance running, they've actually got a relatively good base level of strength that you can start working with and then start building some more specific types of training such as explosive strength training and, and higher volumes of plyometrics and so on um so it is safe and effective and, and again the scientific evidence strongly suggests that children should be doing it like it's probably worth mentioning actually i mean my sort of reflection on it as an academic is five years ago, it was sort of deemed safe and effective to do resistance training as a young athlete, but it's kind of gone a step further over the last five years. And some of the work that's been coming out of groups in the United States is kind of suggesting that um, that if children don't do resistance training um, in their younger years, that they're, they're at a massive disadvantage when it gets to the point of late adolescence and then adulthood in terms of maximizing their own potential and staving off um, risk of injury and so on. And so it seems to be an absolutely crucial and essential part of a young athlete's development, that it's not just kind of do it if you want to do it and if you sort of want to mix up your training a little bit. It's like this is a really key ingredient as part of um, as part of our athlete development. Um, so I think it's important that young athletes are able to find themselves a coach um, and that schools are starting to integrate this as part of their curriculum because... Um, it's, it's incredibly beneficial as part of long-term athlete development to be doing it. I mean, I recall from my junior triathlon sporting days, the concern around it being that uh, strength training would stunt growth uh, and have an effect at the, you know, what's commonly referred to as growth plates. So uh, when did that uh, get uh, dismissed as a valid reason for not having uh, junior athletes do strength training yeah again it seems seems to be a myth that still sort of uh, perpetrates um a lot of the the, sp the, the sporting world but i, I mean in, in the actual scientific literature that myth was dispelled a long time ago um 
I think in the 1980s, there were a couple of reports that there was damage to growth plates. But when you actually look at um, the case studies around which those were, were reported, um, it was due to either unsafe lifting or really high volumes of, of, of resistance training, which, which anybody would consider unsafe. Um, and I mean, actually, completely the opposite is true, that when we do structurally loaded resistance training, so what I mean by that is things like squats, things like deadlifts, where we're loading the skeletal system against gravity, um, we see positive changes in bone mineral density, even in younger age groups. So um, it's, it's hugely beneficial for bone mineral density and growth plate development and so on and so forth, that when you come out of that growth spurt around sort of mid-adolescence, um, that your skeleton and, and your whole kind of physiological structure is that little bit stronger compared to if you hadn't done it. So that's that's fascinating that it's actually almost the exact opposite to uh, often common sentiment. So uh, it's uh, it tends to be so it holds true with so many uh, myths that it's almost like do the opposite and you'll probably be on the right track. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide some uh, some references and some of the probably the best. The best articles to refer your listeners to are some of the position statements that have been put out by uh, some of the, the major paediatric organisations and sports medicine organisations, which are free to download online. And they kind of summarise some of what I've spoken about um, in quite a tidy way. And it's it's, it's fairly understandable. Um, but a lot of these position statements have, have been published over the last five years and, and are really key for practitioners like like myself so we'll include those in the show notes as guidelines and just before we move off the uh the junior runner or the young runner uh i I assume maybe these guidelines do stipulate this but setting limits i mean is it common sense based or are there known limits or stated limits rich that you just don't want to take a certain age child to in terms of maximum loads yes i was referring to before i think to get young, well, we're talking children really. So, you're thinking like really young, so between age sort of five and ten. Um, you really just need them to be emotionally mature enough to be able to step into any sort of sports environment really and follow the instructions of a coach rather and sort of know what they're doing um, rather than just sort of climbing over all the apparatus. And then obviously it does become quite dangerous. Um, and so I think most of the recommendations that have been put out sort of say, yeah, kind of age seven, eight, maybe nine years old, depending upon um, the rate at which they're developing, um, they can follow the instructions of a coach. They can do some basic fundamental movements with it. And, and the retention span is there for sort of an hour or so um, before they then start just, yeah, running riot around the facility. Um and then, yeah, going back going back to your question, um, like lifting very heavy loads, yeah, probably isn't that necessary in younger age groups. Like for me, it's more about establishing the fundamental movement patterns, which require some practice. So slightly higher repetition ranges up to kind of 12 or 15 or so. Um, but again, if, if children enjoy lifting weights and you've got kind of a few sessions where they're lifting safely, they've got good technique, it's supervised, it's a safe environment... There's nothing wrong with nudging the weight up a little bit, particularly as, as they're getting a little bit older and lifting quite heavy. Um, so I wouldn't by by any means say that they're, they've got to be lifting their maximal loads every single session. But um, having periods in, in the training year where um, they're playing around with some really heavy loads safely um, is, is completely fine. But the key message is really that they've got sound technique and, and they're competent at doing the movements and that they're supervised. You're listening to Dr. Richard Blagrove, strength and conditioning coach, researcher, physiologist, and author of Strength and Conditioning for Endurance Running on this Rewired Expert Edition, exploring strength and conditioning for the endurance athlete and runner. Support for today's show comes from Polar, specifically Polar's Polar Pacer and Polar Pacer Pro beautiful running watches. I'm the holder of a Polar Pacer Pro running watch myself, and it is the lightest, most streamlined running watch I've ever owned across three decades of running. These new running watches will give both first-time runners and the serious runner the tools and the insights to track performance and inform training. Engineered specifically for running the Polar Pacer and the Polar Pacer Pro, they're equipped with a variety of functions unique to Polar, providing personalized guidance and support across the entire runner's journey. 
from the first steps to the marathon and beyond. The Polar Pacer Pro, well that's the running watch for those who want to run better. It's one of the most powerful and sophisticated running watches ever built. It's ultra light with a high performance core processor, including an extensive suite of advanced training tools that will help serious runners improve their running economy and performance. With built-in navigation and running power, it debuts at an incredible $499. The Polar Pacer, well that's the watch for those who want to fall in love with running. It embodies the simplicity of running with all the essentials plus the specialized training sleep and recovery tools needed to fall in love with the sport. The Polar Pacer, it helps runners get started at just $299. So if you feel like it's time to beat your best, jump across to Shop Polar over at polar.com to check out the all new Polar Pacer range. Support for today's show also comes from our upcoming live stream event, Positive Sports Psychology, Cultivating Deep Wellbeing, with mental skills coach and positive sports psychology researcher, Rory Darkins. Now, Rory has been one of our most popular expert editions over the six years of the program, so we're really excited to be featuring Rory for three hours as he translates the best of the research into practical and easy to understand mental strategies that can help all of us thrive in not only life, but also sport. There'll be a live Q&A, so don't miss this opportunity to engage with Rory. Jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com forward slash events, and there you can purchase your ticket from 49 Australian dollars, including a post-event recording of the live stream and a PDF copy of the presentation. Now, for our patrons of the show, you'll receive your complimentary access pass to the live stream, so keep an eye out in your inbox. And if you'd like to support production of the show, you can do so over at Physical Performance Show from just five US dollars per month, and there you'll receive complimentary access to our back catalogue and all upcoming live stream events, including Rory Darkins's. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Richard Blagrove, strength and conditioning for the endurance runner on this expert edition Rewired. Rich, uh, let's get into some practicalities or some, I guess, specifics around strength training and maybe the best and most meaningful way to uh, to cover, you know, this large topic would be let's take a runner, a recreational runner, training for uh, either a half marathon or a marathon there, uh, completely um, uh, unaware or it's foreign to be in a gym setting. Where would we start with mapping out a training week? Let's say they're running, you know, uh, you know, fifty to fifty to seventy kilometers a week. So they're, you know, they're getting some decent volume done. How many times a week? Let's start there, and then let's talk about what we might include and and what we'd start with in terms of repetitions and uh, recovery, etc. Yeah, sure. I, I always hate to answer questions with uh, "it depends." <laughs> uh, but when, yeah, whenever we whenever we start talking about a program, it always does. And I think I look at the runners that I've worked with over the last twelve years, um, and no two programs are the same. So I think with the, with the the hypothetical runner you're referring to here, I would kind of look at their I would, I would look at what they're up to in, in the week. So like in addition to their running training, what what else is important is have they got a family. Um, what are their social commitments? What are their work commitments? What what does their general kind of lifestyle look like? Um, what injuries have they had in the past? Um, what are their expectations from strength and conditioning? Like where can they kind of fit it in into the week? And then I would work work from there. So I, I would never kind of approach this type of scenario with um, a kind of set regime in my head where I, I sort of think they're going to benefit from three strength training sessions a week. And those need to be done on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, end of story. Um, it always kind of depends upon the individual. So if, um, if they say, well, I've got time to do two strength training sessions a week and my hard sessions are on a Tuesday, a Thursday and a Saturday. So therefore I could probably fit in something on a Monday, something on a Friday, perhaps. Um, then that's what I would kind of base it around. Um, but I have lots of, lots of runners that, that I work with and, and have worked with in the past that have got such busy lifestyles that they say, I want to do some strength and conditioning, but it's almost impossible for me to fit two 60 minute or 70 minute sessions into my training. We like, there's just nowhere to put it. Um, and what I've presented in a recent publication actually is a slightly different approach um, to programming for runners where instead of dividing strength and conditioning up into two or three sessions a week, I divide it up into what I term training units. 
So training units which typically last for uh, between 10 and 20 minutes. So one training unit might be some calf conditioning, for example. Another training unit might be some strength training where they do a quick five minute warm up and then they just do two strength training exercises. So that might be a squat and a step up, for example. Um, and then a 15, 20 minute block, which is perhaps plyometric training. And they're like, oh, I can do that before I do one of my interval sessions. And as long as they're having five or 10 minutes rest before they actually go into the interval session and the plyometric training isn't particularly high volume, it doesn't, there's no detriment to, uh, to the actual running session. So, um, yeah, hopefully I've given you a couple of examples there, but it sort of depends. Um, I think two or three sessions a week seems to be about optimal. And if they can't manage that, s- split it up into units, which are kind of slotted in before or after running sessions or just where where where, uh, where they can find time. So I like that concept there, Rich, uh, training units if – time seems to be scarce and getting to the gym uh, is just going to be uh, impractical. Uh, in terms of, and you lay this out, Rich, in detail uh, in your book, in a great table, uh, repetitions and sets. So obviously for the unfamiliar, they're not going to get in and uh, start with, with large loads and small amounts of reps. Uh, initially, they're going to try and get used to the movement and you outline the importance of learning the correct movements as you referenced before, preferably with some supervision if they're uninitiated. Uh, so, Rich, uh, can you speak a little bit to, you know, the different types of sets and reps that you might uh, include in a training program under the premise that it always depends on the af- athlete, their yeah. goals, what they're trying to achieve? So I know it's a big, broad question, but uh, reps and sets, what do we need to know, broadly speaking, with regards to that? Yeah, so I think with um, a runner that, hasn't uh hasn't, hasn't done very much strength and conditioning before um as you mentioned the most important thing initially is just to try and acquire the movement skills that i sort of want to use with my, my main kind of core exercises so that does require slightly higher repetition ranges um but given that it's a novel stimulus to them even though they require high repetition ranges it's that it still kind of acts as quite a nice strength uh, strength training stimulus so when i say high rep ranges i'll typically not ever go over 15 um and for resistance training exercises like learning a squat pattern like learning a hip hinge so kind of um an rdl Ro- romanian deadlift as 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 hopefully a lot of people have um uh, have, have heard it called before step ups lunge patterns um press ups things like this yeah i'll be at between about 12 and 15 repetitions at very most and two to three sets of of work um depending upon how much time they've got and how well they're kind of acquiring the skill but i think if you're working with a good coach i, I would be pretty convinced that with almost every single um runner that i start working with at least by the second session i can start adding a little bit of load on some of those exercises um even with some young athletes um and so when i say loads yeah i mean holding a a light kettlebell holding a medicine ball putting a light barbell which weighs about 15 kilograms on their back or holding some light dumbbells and so rather than increasing the, the repetition volume so the number of sets or reps I would then start to increase the intensity a little bit to try and drive some of these strength adaptations. Um, And then for things like plyometric training, because of the additional um, high impact forces that uh, I want runners to start being able to cope with, um, I would focus on the way in which they're landing from jumping, hopping and stepping type tasks. So I'd initially start by just getting athletes to jump up in the air and watch how watch how they're landing. So typically that's going to be slightly higher forces than, than what they're experiencing during um, a running gait um, or doing like a hop and stick type pattern over uh, kind of like a meter and a half or maybe two meters or so and looking at the way in which the way in which they're landing. So coaching the movement and kind of landing mechanics before we start increasing the intensity or the height of various different boxes and so on. Um, and then over time, I'd, I would typically try and try and look to raise the intensity of those exercises. So with resistance training exercises, start nudging the repetition range down to kind of between about six and eight. Um, and as we've already mentioned as, as part of the discussion, like I'd, I generally won't take 
runners down to really low repetition ranges unless they're very experienced in a weight room. So with with novices, so within the first year of, of commencing a resistance training program, I typically won't go much lower than about four or five repetitions if they're looking nicely skilled on the exercise. Whereas runners that I've been working with for a few years, they might go down as low as about three repetitions. But it's the kind of risk reward benefit that I'm, am I going to get much more gain from taking a runner right down to one or two repetitions on what is really quite a general strength training exercise compared to leaving them at three or four repetitions um, where the load's a little bit lighter, but they're probably a little bit safer in terms of uh, in terms of performing the lift. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a need to go really, really heavy um, with most dis- distance runners. And it, it kind of uh, speaks a little bit to a, a question that I have, and that's, you know, for – the, the runner that has been incorporating some strength slash conditioning work into their program for a year, let's say two years, you know, they've absorbed some of those early adaptations. Uh, is it true that they're really just going to get to a point where they're maybe not gaining, but they're kind of more maintaining? Uh, or is it always a goal that we should be trying to uh, progress and it, surely there can't be endless gains found in the weight room for the recreational runner? Yeah, it's a really good question that, and it's it's obviously the area in terms of the scientific literature which is always going to be lacking because it's very very difficult to take reasonably sized groups of participants um, through a training intervention which is lasting much more than um, much more than three months. There's been one study which um, which lasted twelve months, which was done over in Ireland. And just through kind of basic periodization of training, so varying the exercises, the sets, the repetitions over a 12-month period, they did see that um, the gains in strength were still being made. Um, But as you were alluding to, those gains were starting to plateau off a little bit. Um, Like with the runners that I've worked with individually for for years and years, um, it does get to a point where they're relatively strong for what I would consider a relatively strong for a distance runner. And so sometimes with those runners that are a bit stronger, we'll start chasing other types of adaptations which are a bit more related to, related to performance. So slightly higher volumes of plyometric training, for example, um, which have got that little bit more specificity and seem to give the runners the bigger bang for their buck. Um, but yeah, at some point, volume of resistance training is going to have to go up in order to still keep driving strength related adaptations and it's then just trying to achieve the balance between giving them that little bit more volume um, but making sure you're not incurring any sort of hypertrophy or adding fatigue to already quite a busy training program Um, and so yeah in my experience it's it, it, it's quite individual, but I just think you have to shift the priority and uh, and where the focus of the strength and conditioning is. But for a runner that, just say, didn't have access to a professional or anyone that can program them, they get a program uh, week 10, for example, and three years later they're still getting to the gym doing more or less the same thing. Uh, would you say that that's still more beneficial than not being in, uh, not prioritising any strength and conditioning at all? Yeah, I would say so. And there has been a few studies that have looked at people just getting these improvements that we've spoken about, getting improvements in strength and then stopping. Um, and the gains reverse quite quickly. So you see running economy kind of drifting back to where it was, um, the amount of force you can produce on it on uh, in, in strength tests starting to diminish as well. And so it's always it's always going to be better to engage with it. Um, and uh, again, through the advice of somebody that's experienced in programming and you, you, the coach or the trainer that you're working with, I would suggest if you can vary the types of exercise that you pick in, the training modalities, the sets and reps, you can still keep making gains for really long periods of time. No, fantastic. And I certainly have had it said, and I think it resonates, runners need strength training un- until uh, death do them part. So, um, <laughs> Rich, uh, the variables of uh, rest and tempo. So can you broadly speak to rest? What do we need to know there? Is it okay to, you know, in some uh, terms, smash through it and get in and get out? Or do we need to be more aware of time between sets and exercises? Yeah, I mean, for uh, for resistance training exercises and or yeah, plyometric training as well, um, 
I would I would always prioritize quality over, over quantity. Um, and so whether you're a, a runner who's just starting out with um, resistance training and you're just initially focusing on acquiring movement skills, um, like I would still take quite generous rest periods, even though you'd finish a set and you wouldn't be out of breath, your heart rate wouldn't have increased and you don't really feel particularly fatigued. Um, and then as you start to increase the intensity, obviously your nervous system needs to recover in order to maintain the quality and the intensity uh, within the next set. So typically for both resistance training and plyometric training with runners, I would use between about two and three minutes of rest. Again, the kind of textbook answer to this is take at least three minutes rest. But because um, distance runners are so generally so quick at recovering, like the, me- the metabolic system um Certainly the cardiovascular system recovers very, very quickly. And in my experience, they're kind of itching to go at around about a minute and a half, two minutes. Um, and it doesn't seem to affect the quality of the set if we take about two minutes. So somewhere between about two and three minutes seems seems about right. Anything less than two minutes, and I'd suggest you're not, not fully recovered. Um, I mean, one area that we've sort of not spoken about too much is um, I kind of refer to as, as tissue conditioning or um, trying to target specific tissues, mainly in the lower limb, which are potentially vulnerable to injury. And so I will set athletes up on little mini circuits where they're targeting either a specific muscle group or a specific tendon, such as the Achilles tendon, for example, with um, some sort of little circuit training type session where there's a succession of exercises, um, fairly high repetition ranges of like 15 to 20 or so, and they're not really having very much recovery in between them. And so they do feel kind of like a bit of a burning sensation in whatever muscle group they're working in. Um, And so I typically include those types of little circuits towards the end of session, but they're they're not necessarily the priority unless an athlete's rehabilitating from from an injury. So I think... um, I think with those that type of outcome, having short recoveries is is necessary, but with the the resistance training and the plyometric training, like generous recoveries of two to three minutes seems uh, seems more optimal. And if you're doing unilateral or one side training than the other, is it okay to say do a leg extension, left leg, then do the right leg as part of the recovery, and then go back to the left leg? Yeah, that's typically how I'd set it up. I'd still have a bit of recovery, so before you go back to the left leg, and you've got to think if the central nervous system's fatigued, then it's going to affect whichever whichever side you're training. And so I typically do left and then do right or vice versa, and then still have around about two minutes rest before they go again. Um, and again, just with, with runners that struggle a little bit for time and don't like kind of just sitting around for two to three minutes between sets or sometimes superset exercises, um, and supersetting is again one of these sort of bodybuilding terms where we're trying to like stress a muscle and trying to trying to get more volume into a specific muscle. And so the way that I would typically superset isn't in that way, but try and combine um, an exercise like yeah leg press or like a squat with either a different area of the body so like an upper body exercise for example so right do some press ups or do some pull ups in between your in in your recovery or something which is quite explosive in nature so they'd go from doing the squat or a deadlift to doing a box jump for example or doing five repetitions of a drop jump um and then they take the two uh, then they take another minute or so and then they go back to the exercise so structuring sessions in that sort of way gets a little bit more work done um uh in a a short amount of time and means that the runner's kind of not sitting around for two to three minutes if if they dislike that so there are ways to uh ease a runner's anxieties of sitting idle as you've just (laughs) mentioned and i'm putting my hand up there rich i'll be taking that on board and then uh in terms of these uh variables if you like uh of training uh tempo or speed of movement uh yes sorry, any, yeah. anything that we should uh take on board there i mean do we get in and try and do these as quick as we can or slow them down and control them a little um with the resistance training exercises i typically tell athletes to have a controlled descent because um we're trying to get them into like wide amplitudes of movement so deep ranges of movement because that helps kind of stress tendons and ligaments um in very kind of stretched elongated positions where we we see a little bit more adaptation so things like yeah your squats your romanian deadlift um like step up type patterns lunge type patterns 
it's relative relatively slow tempo so two to three seconds into range into end range and then i'd origin always encourage athletes to be as quick as possible out of that position so on the upward or the ascent phase of all those exercises um to be as explosive as they possibly can and then obviously the rate at which they're developing force and kind of moving out of those positions is kind of dictated by how much load that they're lifting um and so if we keep the load low to to moderate it is kind of a, an explosive strength training exercise as opposed to a heavy resistance exercise where it's almost impossible to move very very quickly out of deep positions um so yeah key message is controlled descent and explosive ascent on uh, the kind of multi-joint type exercises that i use um for again i've referred to this as like tissue conditioning so conditioning for specific tendons and muscle groups that are perhaps quite vulnerable to, to getting injured um one of the key outcomes that i look for on that is like longer times under tension so on some of those exercises, I might encourage athletes to be slow into range and out of range, just so we're developing tension over a long a long period of time. And so it's a slightly different adaptation and outcome which uh, which we're looking to achieve. And then lastly, with plyometric training, um, as I've sort of already alluded to already, the key is just being quick out, quick off the ground. So again, if we're roughly on in contact with the ground for a quarter of a second in, in distance running that's sort of what we want to try and simulate with plyometric training but because of the added um forces and the, the increased amount of energy that we're trying to, to dissipate on landing it becomes increasingly difficult to be in contact with the ground for short periods of time and so the key thing that i'd always look to try and cue is just being quick off the ground so using cues like pretend you're landing on glass or pretending pretend the floor's really really hot like you're landing on hot coals and so every every time their foot strikes the ground, they're, they're, they're off again as quickly as they possibly can. So the, the tempo is essentially explosive and quick. Thank you. And, uh, you know, as per your uh, your answer there, Rich, it's, it really does come back to it depends uh, in terms of what's trying to be achieved and when. So I appreciate that. But there's some great, great tips there. The uh, the controlled descent and explosive uh, ascent, ascent, sorry, um, you know, if it's, uh, if it's for that purpose and then also the, you know, the cues that you just gave for plyometric training. And then the, the space that I typically find myself in as a practitioner helping runners rehabilitate is, as you referenced, tissue conditioning. So oftentimes, yes. I guess in rehabilitation mode, you know, uh, a program will encompass that time under tension principle of really trying to, you know, improve the tissues capacity, if you like. So, so thank you, Rich. Uh, a, a, a broad question here, but for, I guess, maybe the more advanced runner, is there anything they need to know about how to, you know, schedule their, look at the, the resistance work they do over a, a season, you know, the off season, the racing season, how might that differ what they're doing in those different phases from a macro type cycle? Yeah, sure. And again, there's, if uh, if you look in some of the textbooks that have been written about periodization, you kind of see these sort of templates, these blueprint type models where people move through kind of building capacity to basic strength, to max strength, to power. And there there is some evidence for those types of approach. So um, like roughly speaking, a macro cycle for a more experienced strength trained athlete looks fairly similar to that. I think what those types of models and template miss is, again, the, the individualization. So when I'm initially screening and testing a runner at the start of the year, I'm looking at, okay, what areas are they deficient in, in terms of their movement, in terms of their physical qualities, what injuries have they had in previous seasons? And so for, for that individual, it's those things that are most important. And so if you're looking at an athlete, and either quite naturally or because they've been doing it for a couple of years, they're quite strong. So their maximal strength is relatively good, but their reactive strength is awful. Then it's there's obvious there's an obvious need to have more of a bias towards reactive strength training over the course of even in, in an entire year compared to just following what it says in the book sort of thing. Um, so, again, sorry, the answer sort of it depends, but I would I would I would try and encourage people to avoid just doing what everybody else does or doing what the textbook says just because um 
that's what's always been done in terms of periodizing periodize the year. And I mean, the other thing that's always important to consider is, um, so with some of the elite athletes that I work with, they go on training camps. And so sometimes they're away for six months of the year. And so the more technical exercises, it's, it's pointless doing it, like giving them those to do while they're on a training camp because I'm not there to coach them. And so it, it makes more sense to do them during the periods of time that they're in the UK and I can get access to them. And equally, um, when they go on these training camps, like some of the training camps are more geared around high volumes of training. Some of them are more geared around um, like higher intensities of training because they're getting ready for an indoor season. And so the strength and conditioning has to kind of complement that. So there's no point in putting certain types of training activity alongside um, their running, running training that they're doing really high volume or they're doing a lot of work in spikes, for example. And similarly, I see runners going to altitude training camps where the terrain is really rutted undulating and it's a bit unstable underfoot and so like part of, part of my responsibility as the strength and conditioning coach is to kind of prepare their body for that and so you're sort of preparing them for the training camp as opposed to preparing them for the competitive season just so they, they survive the training camp they don't kind of come back and they're like oh i've been on the sidelines with injury for two weeks because um i twisted my ankle or whatever um and so I'll, I'll look at the whole training year and kind of go, right, are you having an indoor season or are you trying to compete for a, a cross-country period? Where's your key race in the in, um, in the competitive calendar? And so next year is a great example for that, that the World Championships are in Doha in October. Um, and so it kind of changes where you've got to place the emphasis on both the running training and the strength and conditioning. Um and so, and so the, the way in which you map out this year is is so individual. It, it, it's like where they're based, what facilities have they got, what are the demands of the environment that, that they're in, what injuries have they had, where are their deficiencies in terms of their, their, their own physical makeup. And when you combine all of these things into, uh, into one training program, it often looks nothing like what it might tell you to do in a textbook. Rich, inside a, a week... You know, I might often prescribe uh, in rehabilitation mode a runner strength training on the same day as a run with the following day a complete rest day with the belief yes, that yeah. that's helping to maximise <clears throat> the gains. This might be in the case of a tendinopathy rehabilitation, for example. But uh, is there anything you can share from your knowledge, uh, substantial knowledge around if you are going to strength train and run on the one on the same day, I believe you've covered this in some of your research. You know what's the best sequence there, and I guess once again it depends. And something's better than nothing if it can't be perfect. But if there was a perfect way to do it, what would it be? Yeah, sure. And again, my sort of uh, with my with my science hat on first of all, uh, and I think um, Rich Willie, who was who was on a recent podcast with you, was referring to some of this as well. Um, so with yeah, with my science hat on, looking at the literature, it's it sort of suggests that it um, you need to have at least three hours of recovery after a, a high intensity running session um, if you're going to do strength training on the same day, and ideally at least 24 hours recovery after a strength training session before you do the running session. Um, and so those kind of recommendations have emerged from partly the literature that I've been referring to, so strength training added to a distance runners program, but also the kind of wider concurrent literature um, where potentially athletes' priority is actually to get strength adaptation um, or, or, or for their game sport or whatever. Um, but, yeah, going back to the sort of depends, um, like I'd, I have – some runners that prefer to do their strength training on their easier days. So if their hard running sessions are on a Tuesday and a Thursday, they they're so fatigued after they do their running sessions. They might have covered 10 miles plus um, after they've done warm, warm ups and cool downs that if they come to me and attempt to do a strength training session, even the evening after doing that in the morning, they're too fatigued to do it and they don't get what they want out of the strength training session. So they prefer to, to do it on their easier days and just kind of space it out a little bit through the week. Um, so that kind of adheres to those recommendations and it's kind of, it works for them. Um, but going back to your example, I've, um, I've worked with quite a few runners that prefer to sort of do the opposite of that and do their strength training on their hard days. And so as, as you're suggesting, they have their hard days where they do their hard running and their strength training. And then the following day is, is almost just like a light run, just a 30 or 40 minute um, easy conversational 
pace type run and so they're getting full recovery so they've got nothing that's kind of uh, taxing um tax, taxing them physiologically in any way um and th- there is some research sort of supporting that model um some of it's been published and it's so th- th- a guy that works for the english institute of sport called um michael johnson that uh, most of the research is in sprinters but he was sort of looking at that model that could the sprinters get away with doing their hardest session of the week on a Tuesday morning, have two or three hours off, have something to eat within those two or three hours, and then come back in the afternoon and still display high amounts of power output and explosive strength type exercises? And the research kind of pointed to the fact that they could. So I think as long as you're having two or three hours rest between the hard session and a key strength training session you see, runners seem to be able to get away with it but again within that i think there's some individual preference yeah that's noted and that's that's terrific would you prefer to see a strength training session done before a run as long as there's two to three hour break between them for example or the order doesn't matter i, I would prefer not and again I'm a strength and conditioning coach, but I've I've been a distance runner in the past, and I still do quite a lot of distance running. Um, and the, the priority has to be the running. Um, as much as you sort of want to get athletes strong, um, like the most important thing for the runner is that they're running. Um, and so, yeah, if they've got a hard hill session, tempo running session, interval training, track type session, like that has to take priority both mentally and physically. And so if you're doing some sort of strength training session that's kind of depleting a little bit of, of the glycogen stores, fatiguing the nervous system a little bit, causing some muscle damage, I'd be very surprised if that then doesn't adversely affect their um, their running session. Um, I mean, having said, said all that, uh, the example I gave before of kind of like training units and one of my PhD studies sort of related to this a little bit. Um, I think if the session, I think if a small amount of either plyometric training or strength training is quite light, so like one or two exercises, um, you could probably get away with that. And I think to some extent, you might get a little bit of a sort of potentiation effect. So it might improve performance. But again, the study that I did and, and had published as part of my PhD, we use very well trained runners for that. And so they were doing a small amount of plyometrics before they then did a run to exhaustion on the treadmill. And and we found that running economy improved in the condition where they did the plyometrics before um, they then went on to do the treadmill run. And so, but it wasn't very much plyometrics. And I, I'm keen to stress that, that it wasn't a full blown strength training session. It was, it was, it was quite low on volume, but high on intensity. And they then had 10 minutes rest and went and did the run. Um, and so it's, it's a model that you could play with, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the training units rather than like a whole strength training session. No, thank you, uh, Rich, for, for outlining that. And uh, really what I've taken away from our conversation is, you know, there's a multitude of ways to program a runner for strength training. There's many things to consider, but I guess as an encouragement, uh, if it all seems overwhelming for the recreational runner, uh, triathlete, whatever it may be, then just starting, Rich, surely, just starting something is better than nothing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and even from a, uh, I guess, uh, a home perspective, Rich, would there be anything you'd say to the runner that just says, I hear you, Rich Blaygrove, uh, I understand the many <laughs> benefits, I just cannot get to a facility, I don't have access, I'm remote in a rural community, but I do have some objects around the house. What would you say to uh, someone in that situation? Yeah, and no, I'm really pleased you asked me that actually, because I think um, it, it probably it doesn't come under the myths, but it's it's probably the biggest. I guess you could call it a complaint, but the biggest bit of feedback that I get uh, to, uh, from distance runners and, and their coaches that it's like you're expecting me to go and pay thirty, forty, fifty pounds or dollars or whatever to go and to go and join a gym like i can't afford that that's that's, that's completely unrealistic and i don't ever want to put that message out that you need to go and join a gym um i mean we're we're actually just planning a study at the moment so i'm collaborating with uh colleagues at uh, another institution to try and answer this question that um if we compare a sort of conventional resistance training program and plyometric program, which is done in a gym-based setting, and try and simulate the movements in a home-based setting with either 
elastic bands that you can buy from the internet for for relatively cheap or just like you say objects that you can find around the house so filling up a backpack or using um isometric isometric type contracts so static type contractions against door frames and walls and things like that like how close can we get to the same level of adaptation and if we can get close to it does that kind of infer a an improvement in running economy and time trial performance and i think if we can um if we can execute this study well, it will be a really kind of high impact and meaningful study for runners because it will sort of prove that you can do resistance training in in a, in a home based environment without having to go and fork out for a gym membership. Um, and so that yeah, there, there are imaginative ways that you can load in a home based environment. And uh, I think you take an exercise which which is quite simple, like a single leg squat, like a single leg squat. Is, is a real strength training exercise, like moving your whole body weight up and down on one leg is, is really quite challenging. Um, and so if you can progress runners to doing something like that, you can't, you can't kind of deny that they're not, they're not getting stronger. Um, and again, plyometric training can be virtually done anywhere, as long as you've got a small space to do it and something to either jump on or off or jump over, um, then you, you can do plyometric training. And, and uh, as I've already said, that's probably the, the training activity that runners will get the biggest bang for their buck in terms of strength training. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't think runners have got an excuse really. And it's just a case of working with a, an SNC coach or a trainer to try and find ways in which you can load and, and do this sort of stuff at home. Rich, thank you for uh, encouraging us that that is the, the key takeaway. Just do something, even as you mentioned, even if it's a training unit of five or 10 minutes, it doesn't have to be a, yes. a grand 70 minute uh, gym session necessarily. Great if it can be, but if it can't be, uh, get creative. Rich, finally, uh, a few final questions here. If you could boil everything, this is a, an impossible question, but we'll go with it <laughs> into one piece of advice. If you could only give runners out there looking to perform at their best of any level one piece of advice around all your work and knowledge to date what would it be and why be consistent um and again that's probably the most basic training principle but <clears throat> it's um it's the kind of it's, it's the one one mistake that i think even though it's it sounds so simple um like I think athletes generally and certain certainly runners, they try to rush progression too much, um, both in their running training and in strength and conditioning. And I've been guilty of it as 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 an athlete and, and a runner over the last couple of decades. But um people just want to make improvements really quickly. They're focused on the next race, the next event that they're training for. Um and the rate at which they try and progress volume and or intensity is usually just too quick. And so, like, yeah, the better message might be be patient <laughs> rather than be consistent. But if you're not patient and you don't progress training slowly and gradually, not just within months, but over years and years, inevitably you get injured um, or overtrained. And if one of those two things occurs, then you're not consistent with your training. Um, and if you're not consistent, you won't improve. And so I think, yeah, be consistent by being more patient with the rate at which you're progressing your training. Because if you're consistent, if you're, if you're running day in, day out, if you're doing strength training regularly, every single week over years and years, you can't kind of not get better. Um, it's, it's, yeah, you, you'll adapt. And so, yeah, be consistent by being more patient. That's a very powerful principle, Rich. Uh, I feel like I must selfishly sneak one more question in, and that is uh, you mentioned earlier about bone mineral density. Uh, I think there's a growing trend in awareness about the health of uh, a runner's bones, but uh, are there any key parameters that really do help augment a runner's bone mineral density, noting that running doesn't seem to be an activity that promotes uh, bone uh, adaptation positively in terms of building bone uh, or improving bone mineral density, but certainly does appear to maintain it uh, across the lifespan better. But um, what would you say to anyone out there that's looking to increase their bone mineral density around strength and conditioning principles? What's important to know? Again, I, th I think I mentioned in response to one of, one of the previous questions, like the way the, the way in which bones will, will, will typically adapt and in, increase in their density per uh, kind of volume of, 
backbone is that um, they need to kind of experience kind of shearing forces, so kind of bending forces through through their middle part. And so in order to deliver that, you do need like a relatively high load or force that's coming in from the top in order to, to get the bending. And so they'll they'll really start, they'll really adapt with a kind of high magnitude or intensity of load, but they won't like it if they experience high volumes of that. So that's typically what we see with distance runners, that they're... Um, they're experiencing loading, so which is above kind of a, a minimal essential strain threshold. So you you will get changes in bone mineral density from running, but it also comes at very very high volumes, um, and so that's when you start to to see stress responses and stress fractures occurring because the bone can't uh, the bone essentially can't adapt quick enough to the rate at which um, of the volume at which you're, you're giving it more and more load. So in a strength and conditioning sense. Um, like structurally loaded exercises um, like squats, deadlifts, step ups, holding dumbbells or or with a bar across your back um, will drive changes in bone mineral density and and also plyometric training obviously as well because uh, because of the um, the increased loading that, that the bone's having to experience but Again, if, if runners are running really high volumes, that's that's where you've got to be a little bit careful with how much, particularly plyometric training they're doing, because um, essentially if they've already got a high volume of that type of work in there already and you give them more of that sort of volume, it's actually going to be detrimental. And so that's, again, where I'd prioritise the quality of the plyometric work over the quantity. And as when I first start runners doing plyometric training, Training, they're doing no more than about 30 foot contacts. So, I mean, landing off moderate height boxes, doing hops and sticks. You only need a couple of exercises, two or three sets, to in order to achieve 30 foot contacts. And probably the highest that I've got an elite runner up to in terms of doing two or three plyometric training sessions a week isn't more than about 100 foot contacts. And so that's doing hopping, bounding for distance and jumping on and off various different height boxes. And you can get that type of work done in about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and so, yeah, we're not talking about like really, really high high volumes of work. Um, I mean, the other thing that's just I've mentioned really, really briefly is that with um, female athletes in particular, if, um, if they're experiencing an energy um, deficiency, and they um, they have irregular menstrual cycles and potentially become um, have a complete absence, which is referred to as amenorrhea. Then um, we get uh, we get estrogen um, release, which has been disturbed. And estrogen we know is the key hormone which drives bone health um, in females. And so if yeah females aren't eating enough or they're doing a high volume of training and and it's not being met through the, their uh, caloric intake in in their diet then potentially that's going to adversely affect bone health uh, very very quickly and so it's really important that the athletes are eating enough yeah bone health uh, is such a big uh, big area but thank you for uh, briefly outlining some of the key things to consider rich uh, every guest of the physical performance show in this case an expert edition with yourself uh, is asked this question and that is three people at, din- at a dinner table uh, living or past Who's at your dinner table and why? It's an insight into your personality. Um, yeah, I'm a bit obsessed with sport. <laughs> so uh, like all the people that I'm like, oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't wonder what that answer to such and such a question is. Uh, is Yeah, it's always pe- people from uh, sport, the sporting domain. Um, I mean, when I was when I was younger, I used to I used to read a lot of books. So biographies of um, famous distance runners and their coaches and so on. Um, and probably the book that had the most influence on me was written by Herb Elliott's coach called Percy Cerutti, um, who I'm sure you, I'm sure you, sure you know. Um, and so he, he would probably be at the dinner table, certainly, because, I mean, I think he had some fantastic ideas and he was generations ahead of his time in terms of uh, his training philosophy and so on. Um, I think I'd re- also really like to speak to Steve Ovette. Um, I think he was a bit of an enigma when it came to um, sort of the way in which he disclosed his personality and his characteristics to the media and the world. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to meet him. And I think I think probably third person, this sounds like a, a geeky 
answer is probably going to be an academic um, who's published a lot in various different areas. I mean, I'm I'm really interested in Jared Fletcher's work, who's a Canadian um, muscle physiologist and biomechanist. Um, I could probably invite him to dinner already, so it probably wouldn't be too too difficult. And the other one that's the, the other scientist who's really influential in uh, in a lot of different SNC coaches' work is um, this is a guy called Peter Wayand, who's uh, who's based over in America. Um, again, having having a meal with him, I think would be fascinating uh, because he's got insight into a lot of different areas around locomotion and running running uh, running gates and so on. So. I think any of those three or four. Thank you, Rich. Rich, uh, physical challenge for the week. Every guest issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So what is Rich Blagrove's physical challenge of the week going to be? I think around the themes that I've spoken about, it would probably be appropriate to give uh, hopefully a lot of runners that are listening a, an exercise which they can do at home. So my challenge would be can uh, can people do – an overhead, so I mean holding a broomstick or a light bar above your head, an overhead single leg pistol squat. So standing on one leg, can you squat all the way down to the ground whilst holding with arms extended a broomstick over your head, which is a really challenging exercise, particularly if you're trying to keep a neutral um, spine position. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've got I've got some exercises which I'd, I'd use to build athletes up to that, which kind of start with um, just a simple step up onto onto a step and then a dead leg step up where um you're doing the step up but your your free leg is remains in complete extension so it doesn't kind of assist the movement of the working leg at all and then increasing the height of the step um and then potentially once you go to a single leg squat using some sort of counter uh counterweight so the classic example being like a sort of trx counterweight squat where you're holding onto two handles you're doing a single leg squat but some of your body weight's kind of removed by the way you're gripping and it, it sort of aids balance as well then progressing to a, a pistol squat and then progressing to arms overhead bar in hands overhead pistol squat and i believe before we started recording uh you said you'd be happy to pr- uh provide a video uh of this so uh we'll link <laughs> I've that i myself up by saying that <laughs> we'll I'm link that up <laughs> I'm going to have to try and execute this now. <laughs> we'll link that up. It's been a few years, you told me. We'll link that up in the show notes and, uh, and, and listeners, you can jump over there and, uh, and see this in action, uh, demonstrated by Rich himself. Rich, if we want to find out more about you, uh, where's the best place to find you? And also, where's the best place to pick up, uh, strength and conditioning for endurance running your book? So probably the best place, I'm fairly active on Twitter. Um, so my handle is at rich underscore Blaygrove. Um, so that's, I guess, the best place to sort of follow any publications or work that I'm currently involved with. Um, people are, 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 uh, are perfectly fine to email me. So my email address is richard.blaygrove, so B-L-A-G-R-O-V-E at bcu.ac.uk um and yeah my book um it's published by the crowwood press but i think you, on i think on amazon you can get new and used uh for a little bit cheaper than than what the publishers are selling it for so um probably the best place to go is, is on, on amazon it's called strength and conditioning for endurance running and it is a terrific uh, book so uh congratulations to mine arrived literally today and I have been uh, enjoying perusing it through the day. So, Rich, uh, thank you very much for your time and your generosity around sharing just some of the the years of condensed knowledge into uh, into our time today. So, thank you very much for uh, for sharing. No problem at all. I've really enjoyed it. I feel feel like we've covered a lot of ground as well. <laughs> So there you have it. I hope and I know you enjoyed the many learnings to be had from Dr. Richard Blagrove's share-ins. I thoroughly recommend picking up a copy of Richard's book, Strength and Conditioning for Endurance Running. It sits never too far from my clinical workstation and my home library. It's a terrific resource that all endurance athletes and practitioners would benefit from. Now, you can engage with Richard over on Twitter at Rich underscore Blagrove. 
Speaking of the socials, you can find the show at Physical Performance Show across all the platforms. And don't forget to check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are now posting full release video episodes along with interesting snippets from our guests in each episode. So jump over to YouTube, The Physical Performance Show. Massive thanks, as always, to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, Audio Engineering, Susan Wilkin, Show Administration, Matthew Olding, Graphic Design, Milan Borrow, Videography. If you have feedback for the show, you can reach me over on the socials at Brad underscore Beer. And if you are a runner or endurance athlete struggling with bone, tendon or joint related concerns, myself and the Pogo Physio team are available for online telehealth consultations over at pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. Now, coming up on the Physical Performance Show, we'll be taking a look at inflammatory conditions, particularly spondyloarthropathies in sport. We'll hear from some of the planet's hottest endurance athletes on featured performer episodes and so much more. So until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Physical Performance Show.